Well, welcome to Mex Online Campus. Today, we come to the end of our Fear of Missing Out series. We've heard a lot of fun feedback from you, so I'm glad you've been enjoying it. It's been a series on experiences that are uniquely available to the Christ follower that, ironically, the typical Christ follower isn't experiencing. So with each one, I've been wanting to purposefully create some fear of missing out. So far, we've talked about experiencing the power of God through prayer, available to all Christ followers, but experienced by a surprisingly few. We talked about life in the Spirit, experiencing the transforming work of the Holy Spirit and the power for life change it brings, and not just life change, but leadership and direction. And again, how so many have never experienced this, but they could. And then last week, we looked at this thing called spiritual gifts and how every Christ follower has been given at least one, a gift that was given so that you could make the difference with your life that that gift was intended to allow you to supernaturally make. Yet so many have never discovered their gift or developed their gift or even deployed their gift. And if you've uh, been taking the series in and you wouldn't consider yourself a Christ follower, I've been kind of encouraging you along the way, hey, uh, this is waiting for you if you ever do cross the line of faith. With each one, I've also had a bit of a personal theme. Furthest thing from my mind was to try to make anyone feel guilty about not having experienced these things or ashamed or embarrassed in any way. The goal really was to help you see what you've been missing out on that is truly there to experience and then how you can engage it for your life. And that is true, again, for our fourth and final experience that I don't want you to miss out on. And here it is. I don't want you to miss out on God's financial favor. Because if you're a Christ follower, you are meant to experience financial favor. You're meant to experience God's direct involvement in your financial life. You're supposed to have a boldness in asking for God's financial provision and a deep satisfaction that you really are becoming who you most want to be when it comes to your finances. Okay, quick time out. <laughs> I want you to hang with me here because I'll bet if I had telegraphed that the final installment of this series was going to touch on something related to money, there's a decent chance you wouldn't have logged in for today's service. And you know what? I don't blame you. Because chances are, if you've ever heard some, I don't know, religious guy talking on, about money on TV or maybe heard a message on money in a church sometime in your past, or it probably reeked of guilt and shaming. And it was probably insufferably self-serving. I hate it. And I know you do too. But if you've been around Mech for any length of time, uh, you know that's not us. I want to talk to you about how you can experience God's financial favor because I want you to experience God's financial favor. I don't want anything from you. I just want something for you. And so many of you aren't experiencing what God wants to bring to your financial life. So if you'll let me, let me just teach on this a little bit, kind of give you how this is played out in the Bible. And you do with it what you will, okay? Uh, but I want to cast a vision as best I can for the experience God wants you to have when it comes to him and money. And then hopefully give a couple of encouraging words at the end as well. Okay, if you're game for that, let's jump in. Let me read a foundational passage and then we'll unpack it. These are words uh, of the prophet Malachi that record a kind of dialogue between God and the people. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? Will a mere mortal rob God, yet you rob me? But you ask, how are we robbing you? in tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, your whole nation, because you're robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it is ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Now, if some of that language lost you, uh, you're in good company. <laughs> Let me give you a quick definition of five keywords. Tithe, offering, storehouse, curse, blessing. Probably some of the words that most jumped out at you. The word tithe literally means 10%. And it was a term that was used for the practice of taking 10% of everything that you earn 
whether through labor or inheritance, windfall or sale, and giving it to God. And it was to be the first thing that you did with your money, not the last thing with what was left over. And it was to be based on all of your income. That's the idea behind that phrase, bring the whole tithe in. Apparently, part of the problem was that people were uh, playing around with this, making it a game like beating the IRS and the tax code, as if some of them were saying, okay, now is this tithe on the net or is it on gross? Does it include what I inherit? Or if I sell some stock, is it on the initial value of the stock or on how it's appreciated over time? And is it on my salary or does it also have to include my bonus too? For God, this was a heart issue one that spoke to the reality that our very next breath is a gift from his hand. Uh, it was an issue that we're truly honoring him as God. So he cuts through it all and says, bring the whole tithe on everything that you have been given and on all that you have received. And God says that it's his. And not just because he's asked for it, because I mean, it really is his. Everything we have is his. If there is a God, then everything we have has been given to us. Our health, our intelligence, our abilities, it all comes from God. Everything we have is a direct result of God's enablement. So in this reading, you could almost say, it, you know, God's saying, um, okay, I've given you 100%. I'm going to let you keep 90, <laughs> you know, and just return 10. Uh, that's my gift to you. This is how the Bible speaks to this. It says, you may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. So if you pat yourself on the back for all of your financial accomplishments, remember that the very next breath you take in is a gift from God. So don't pat yourself on the back too much. Your intellect, your abilities, your natural skills, th these are all a God thing. Whatever it is that enabled you to earn what you have, well, that's been given. So anyway, that was the tithe, the first 10%. Now, an offering, second word, was anything you gave above and beyond your tithe because 10% was considered to be the bare minimum anyone would dream of returning to God because that's the minimum he had asked for. It was seen as, well, you can think of it this way. It's kind of like seen as the floor, but not the ceiling. So periodically out of gratitude and commitment to God, people would give an offering above and beyond their 10%. Just like we do, if you've been around Matt for very long, you know that we have this thing called uh, giving to Christ at Christmas every year, which we have a time of offering that we give to uh, the poorest of the poor and various Missions 2.0 projects around the world and around our city. These are above and beyond offerings. And the way you would give either one was to give it to the storehouse. So what's the storehouse? The storehouse was attached to the temple and was the place where the temple funds and resources and valuables were stored for use. Uh, the temple was the designated place of the people for worship. It was the center of a person's community of faith. It was the central organizer for ministry for the people of God. Over time, through the coming of Jesus, the temple uh, becomes the local church. In fact, in writing to the church at Corinth, uh, this is what Paul, one of the first leaders of the early church who had been personally appointed by Jesus, had to say. He said, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple? You know, that continuity is going on. God's temple is sacred and you together are that temple. Um, which is why throughout the New Testament, uh, the tithes and offerings of God's people were to go to the local church that they considered themselves to be a part of. You could give above and beyond offerings anywhere you wanted to other places, but not the tithe. So the tithe is not what you give to the United Way or a parachurch ministry or disaster relief or your, you know, your school or your college, but to your church. And when asked if that was still to be the case uh, by the people in Jesus' day, because he got asked about it straight up, uh, he gave a pretty straight up, hard to misunderstand reply. He said, you should tithe. Yes. <laughs> so uh, next question. Because when people don't do this, when they keep everything that God gives them or don't allocate it the way God asks, it is serious and it's considered to be serious. As we just read, we're told that it, it removes us from God's blessing. In fact, not only does it remove us from God's blessing, but it actually places us under a curse. And that's a strong word. So let's make sure we understand it. To be under a curse wasn't like being under some kind of spell or enchantment you would read about in a fairy tale or read in a Harry Potter book. In the Bible, to be under a curse from God meant that you were outside 
of his blessing. You are outside of his umbrella of protection and provision. Um, it meant that you were operating independent of his spiritual oversight and intervention. You were isolated from God's care. Now, compare that to the idea of blessing. There are two extremes people can take on what the Bible is teaching here about being blessed. The first extreme is what would be called this health and wealth prosperity kind of approach that says tithe and you too can drive a Mercedes because God will get you one. That somehow this is the key to a seven figure salary and a 10,000 square foot home. Okay, official garbage. <laughs> but there's another extreme that's just as off base. It's the idea that there's no blessing attached to this, uh, attached to the tithe. Because we just read there most certainly is. There is a relationship between what you do financially and what God does. The Bible teaches without qualification that if you follow God into this aspect of financial management, if you return to him what he's asked from all that he's given, he'll bless your life. Absolute promise. So what kind of blessing are we talking about? It's totally up to God. Uh, it's really not spelled out. It certainly could be financial. It could also be the blessing of ongoing financial security. It could be personal joy. It could be depth of character. It could be a sense of fulfillment or being used to make an impact or being granted a wider influence, uh, receiving an abundance of creativity in an area where you need it and would benefit from it. There can be blessing from God on relationships, your marriage, families. Uh, there can be favor shown on an enterprise an expansion that you're wanting to make, a breakthrough, or maybe uh, the attempt of a discovery. When you think of a blessing from God, it is limited only by his creativity, but it is always designed specifically for the recipient. But there is one thing we can say for sure, because God is very specific about one dimension of how he'll bless us through the tithe. There's one thing he says that we can be absolutely confident of having come our way. And all other kinds of blessings can happen, and what those might be, we're not told, but there's one that he says, but this one you can count on, on top of everything else. But there, here it is. Let me read it again. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it is ripe. Okay, crops on, in the field and fruit on the vine, that was income. Uh, that was their livelihood in that agrarian society. That was their money supply. If pests devoured the crops, there was no crop to sell or trade. If fruit fell off the vine before it was ripe, it was useless in terms of being able to be harvested and sold. And that was a huge blow to your income if that happened. So what is God saying? You tithe, you be faithful to me financially, and I'll be faithful to you financially. God is making clear that those who follow him in this area will never have to worry about their giving taking away from their supply. They can rest assured they will not lose ground because of their obedience. That if they give 10%, God will protect the 90%. You know, he'll, he'll make that go just as far, if not farther. He'll supernaturally care for their needs. It's as if God is saying, look, uh, trust me enough, care about me enough to do what I'm asking you to do here. And in return, I will become supernaturally involved in your life in a unique way, bringing incredible levels of blessing, including a specific blessing that you will never have to worry that your giving will leave you without enough for your own needs. Take care of your money in the normal ways. Obviously, don't binge, don't go crazy with debt, don't, don't kind of play a game with God. Do your part, and God says, I'll do mine. The idea is that the tithe is not about losing 10% but gaining thousands of thousands of percent from the hand of God in countless ways. In other words, it's a dang good investment. It's not about somebody sticking their hand in your pocket, really. It's about opening up your pocket for a hand to put something in at God's pleasure and discretion. So that's the teaching. That's, that's what I don't want anyone to miss out on, the financial favor that God wants to bring to bear. It's the favor that you can experience as a Christ follower as you act in obedience with the tithe to the church of which you are a part. Let me say a word or two about this. I know, I think, how some of you are thinking, or more, more to the point, what some of you are feeling right now. Um, defeated. <laughs> Discouraged. 
you hear this and you want to do it, you know you should do it, but you're up to your eyeballs in debt uh, or your margin of income and uh, versus expense is just so thin that giving God 10% is just impossible. I mean, it's just, you know, it's just, it's not even on the table. It's not a question of me, you know, okay, I'm, I'm going to do this. It's like, I can't do this. So it's end of story. And so I just made it even worse because you're thinking, so not only am I now missing out on all this, but uh, thank you, Pastor Jim, for telling me I'm also now under a curse. <laughs> so folks, let me, let me, um, let me remind you of something. God is for you. He is not against you. Uh, he loves you. He's not trying to impose a legalistic set of do's and don'ts that are going to be impossible for you to follow so that he can make your life miserable or abandon you at his first chance. That's not the God of the Bible. Let me tell you what I've told people for years as a pastor about the tithe and the heart of God. Begin where you are. Start with what you can. Just start working toward a tithe. It's not all or nothing. You can start gradually and you know work your way up. And this high idea of starting where you are and doing what you can is, is, a, is a deeply biblical idea when it comes to how God is working with us. Over and over you see God calling his people throughout the pages of the Bible to do something. And it's often a huge task. I mean, it just seems Herculean at the, top, at the beginning. And his first word is almost never accomplish this. It's almost always begin this. Begin this. It's not as much, you know, do this now, as much as start this now. For example, when God led the Israelites to the promised land, he told them, he said, now, you know, here it is, but you're going to have to take possession of it. And it was a lot of land to possess. It could take months, years to do that. But let me read you the language God used when he put this to them. It's very important. He said, begin to take possession of it. He didn't say, I expect you to accomplish this immediately. As much as he said, I expect you to start this at once and I'll be with you every step of the way. It's the same with your money. Uh, it's as if God is saying, look, start, start toward this. Get moving. I'm not expecting you to be able to pull this off overnight. I know what your situation is. <laughs> I mean, and this is a seismic shift. And I know it's going to take some time. But um, would you start it for me? Start. Um, position your heart. Acknowledge me as leader. Honor me and trust me. And begin. Now, if you can start with 10%, do. But if it's just 2 to 3%, you know, do that. It's legal. And it's not only legal, but for most people, it's going to be a necessity. So begin to work toward a full tithe. Like I said, give 1, 2, 3%, whatever you can, with a commitment to keep increasing it as you move toward greater levels of financial freedom. Because the more you get into the Bible and financial freedom, the more you see how the Bible is so comprehensive and so holistic and so sensitive to our situation. So it talks about things like getting out of debt and building up savings and you know living within our means and all the kinds of common sense things and encouragements that we need. God will be delighted with those kinds of beginning steps. And he'll be delighted with you because he knows what's going on in your heart and where you're positioning your heart. So if you've leveraged yourself with debt, or living expenses, or you have other commitments or realities that just make it so that you genuinely don't have the margin to start a full tithe, start gradually. And no matter how small your start may have to be, make the start. Now, let me add that starting gradually, and this is very important to hear, um, if I can give you a little spiritual coaching on this, doesn't mean you wait until it happens naturally. It won't happen naturally. This is one of those things that will never happen naturally. It has to happen intentionally. For many of you, giving even one, two, or three percent to God and his work will be the most stretching step of faith you've ever taken. Faith that God will honor as you honor him. Faith that he will provide for you and care for you. But it's going to have to be intentional. You intentionally are trusting. You're intentionally taking the step of obedience. You're, you're going to do it. And then God shows up. Here's how Jesus talked about that faith component. He said, so don't worry about these things saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? 
These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else, live rightly, and he will give you everything you need. Kind of sounds like the blessing and the promise Malachi talked about, doesn't it? So again, and once you do this, there's so much more that comes with it. I mean, I, I, I could do a whole series on just the wonders of, of, you know, beyond the blessings, beyond the promises. But let me just give you one uh, for me that I, you know, came to my mind and spirit the quickest. It means that for me and, I, and for others that I can make confident asks. I can go to God in prayer and ask with absolute confidence for his help for his supply, for his intervention on all things financial. Uh, and I say confidently because I know I'm being obedient to him financially. Uh, I'm doing what he's asked me to do. So I can, I can call on his promises without blushing, without any type of awkwardness. So just, you know, let me ask you, where are you needing God like never before, right now when it comes to money, when it comes to your financial challenges that you're facing where are you desperately wanting to cry out to him for help? You need to cry out to him for help. You need his help, but you feel like you can't. Now is when you want to be able to turn to him without embarrassment or without awkwardness and boldly, expectantly beg him for help, to honor you because you have honored him. And you can't because you haven't. But you can. You can begin, just start. And wherever you're able to start, God will smile and encourage you every step of the way. And you can pray to him with confidence about any and every financial need that you have in your life. As well as being able to count on his blessings and his provision. <laughs> you know, and I was thinking about this, I'll never forget a few years ago when I was teaching about this. Um, I was walking around between services at our physical campus and a guy caught me in the atrium afterwards. And he said, you got just a second? I said, sure. You know, that's why I'm walking around. <laughs> and uh, he, said, uh, he said, here's the truth about me. I am so brand new to Christ, it's not even funny. I met Christ here at Mech. You baptized me. Uh, but I did not honor God with my finances one bit before I came to Christ. And the whole time I was attending here before I became a Christ follower, in fact, you know, up until even now, to my shame, he said, you could probably go through the financial records and see that there's not even... 10 bucks on my record that I gave. I'm learning more about what all this involved, but I'm, I'm up to my eyeballs in debt. I got student loans. I'm, I'm over mortgaged. You know, I got way too much house than I should have gotten. It's kind of a mess. I, I make a good salary, he said, but I'm still living functionally, you know, paycheck to paycheck. After hearing what you said today, he said, I'm going to start. I'm going to give what I can and I'm going to go to work toward a tithe and I'm going to get there because I really have come to Christ and I want to be all in and I want all that God has for me. And I, I just said, well, but I'll be praying for you. And I said, that's, you know, way to go. I forgot about that conversation until he stopped me again. This was like a year and a half later. Um, and I, I, he came up to me and he just kind of said, almost in passing, he said, you know, he, but then he stopped. He said, you know, I'm there. <laughs> I said, you're where? Because <laughs> I wasn't connecting with this conversation we had months earlier. He said, I, I tithed this week for the first time. It took me over a year, but I've never gone without. God always supplied. And he said, you keep telling people what the Bible says because it's true. And he said, it's been an incredible journey of God, uh, he said, showing me what he can do when I trust him. And he said, and oh yeah, you were right about the prayer stuff. The way I feel I can pray now, you were so right. I mean, I feel I can really ask God for help in any way. And, you know, it's not awkward. And he said, it's just beyond cool. <laughs> and he said, thanks. And he walked off. And I thought to myself, yes, it is way beyond cool. So wherever you are, wherever you start, get in on this blessing. Take God up on this. Uh, start tithing or at least working toward it, giving back to God, to the church of which you are a part that you consider to be your church. If this is it, then do it here. If it's not, do it to the one that is. Um, that's between you and God and that church. But start. And then sit back and just watch what God will do. 
trust me, experiencing God's financial favor is not something you want to miss out on. Okay, next week we have something very special that you are not going to want to miss. It's our Vision Weekend, a kind of a standalone event, and it's also the celebration of Mech's 30th anniversary. And the stuff we've got cooked up, uh, it's you're not going to want to miss. It's just pretty cool. Some of this stuff's been in development for months. So make sure that you join us um, next time. Until then, let me pray for you. Father, uh, I've enjoyed this series just as a pastor because I, I love trying to help people and encourage people to experience all that they can of your goodness and provision and love and joy. And um, I, I just hate it when people are in a relationship with you, but they're not experiencing all the wonderful things that you want to bring to bear on their life. Today's no different. Money is such a real part of our life, and we all have financial needs, and we all have financial concerns, and, and often can have anxieties. And, and I just pray, Father, that um, we would invite you in. Do what you say, and then let you do what you say you'll do. And what a good thing that would be. And so I pray for that, Lord. I do, unashamedly, for everyone. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.